Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Pro Tour Oath of the Gate. Watch a Marshall Cycliff. I'm joined by Ian Duke, and we're ready for more modern action. Let's head down to the floor for round six. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Oath of the Gate. Watch, I'm Marshall Cycliffe in the booth with Ian Duke, and we're ready for round six. This is modern. We've got Tiago Saparito in our feature match area. He's placed for face-to-face -face games. New member of that team, Ian, and uh, his opponent, Jason Chung, out of New Zealand. Tiago's from Brazil, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, out of New Zealand is playing for MTG Mint Card. You can take a look at Jason. We've got a really cool matchup here, by the way. A little blast from the past in Jason's hand. He's playing Blue Moon. Now, I will note that he has Mulligan to five here, so we'll keep that in mind as our match starts. His opponent, Tiago Saparito, is on this Eldrazi deck, new, new to the format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this Blue Moon deck was popular, I believe, two years ago at Pro yeah. Tour Board of the Gods. It, it actually top aided in the hands of Li Shi Tian. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't really seen it much since then, but it's making a comeback here. On the other side of the table, we have... Uh, an Eldrazi deck variant. This is similar to the Channel Fireball Eldrazi deck that we saw last round. Yeah, it should be matches. the same deck. They did uh -huh. team up with Channel Fireball face-to-face, -face okay, and Channel okay. Fireball were kind of a mega team for this event, so I, I'm sure that Tiago's on the team deck here. Now, one of the sort of key points that I'm going to be looking out for here from Jason Chung's standpoint is, in fact, Blood Moon. I mean, it's in the namesake of the deck itself. And what does that do to the Eldrazi deck? Yeah, great question. So it's kind of like a super stone rain slash mana hoser kind of deal. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, Blood Moon known for hosing mana. Um, but importantly, what it does against this Eldrazi deck is it shuts off the special abilities of Eldrazi Temple and Eye of Ugin. And it also almost totally denies the deck from producing colorless mana. The only ways to produce colorless mana with a Blood Moon on the table are the two copies of basic wastes in the deck. Right, so it strips that away, which effectively blanks, looks like 12 of the cards in the deck. Those would be the four Matter Reshaper, the four Thought Knot Seer, and the four Reality Smasher. We also see Chalice of the Void on one here. This is one of the big innovations, and boom, there it is. Blood Moon, but is it too late? He's already facing down seven power here and getting crunched. Yeah, I, I think it might be too late here, Marshall. This is a, a was a pretty great start from the Eldrazi deck here with the early Chalice, the Void, shutting off the cantrips and card flow. You can see Chung there stuck with two copies of Serum Vision in his hand. Uh, tries tries for one this turn. Yeah. Just, I guess maybe to see to check and see if Tiago would uh, remember the trigger. <laughs> you see the little smirk ability. there from uh, trying to get away with Chung. something. Yeah, I mean <laughs> he's just like, hey, I have nothing else to do. If you forget, it'll it'll go through. <laughs> It did not work, though, and this could be a quick one here. It's going to be a spell skite from Saparito, which doesn't add to the clock. He actually could have gone for the win there, right? Anyway, either way, he picks up the victory here. Saparito, a very quick game one over the uh, mulligan to five. Jason Chung, we'll be back right after these messages. Start on your road to the Pro Tour by playing in a preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. With more than 2,000 locations running events around the world, you're sure to find one near you. Visit magic.wizards.com slash pptq for schedules and information. Welcome back to the feature match area here in Atlanta. Let's jump over and uh, see what's going on on our back table there, where we've got John Stern from Canada. He plays for Team Face to Face Games and uh, Antonino De Rosa. It's good to see him at, at a PT. It's a name we don't always see here. And uh, Antonino's playing Just Guy Control. 
which is a deck I'm curious to see how well it does. I've seen a few of them down in the feature match area already. And he's got a pair of Wall of Omens. It looks like a Lightning Bolt in the graveyard as well, facing down John Stern, who's on Affinity. This is a, a more kind of classic modern matchup, what we'd be used to. Yeah, definitely. Um, Anthony no actually tested with uh, Team Pantheon this, uh, for this tournament. Um, as you said, Marshall, he hasn't been someone we've seen a lot on the Pro Tour in recent years, but um, a former pro player with uh, a lot of Pro Tours under his belt. Glad to see him back. Not bad to jump back in with the Pantheon either. Absolutely. No better team to prepare with, or few better teams, I should say, at least. Yeah. yeah we've got a chance to uh, take a little tour of the Pantheon testing house this time with Brian David Marshall earlier today. Really fun excursion there. One and one. So here's a nice Electrolyze from Antonino. Takes out a Steel <laughs> Overseer. Steel Overseer, one of the big payoff cards for the Affinity deck that John Stern is playing. There's a few of them, though. There's Arcbound Ravager. Cranial Plating and that one are, are kind of the, the three <coughs> ways you can just go nuts with this deck. He's got a Ravager in his hand, is John Stern. He doesn't have any way to get in for much damage right now. <coughs> Those Wall of Omens holding the, fart, the fort nicely here. And it is going to be a Ravager <coughs> here from Stern. It looks like everybody's got a cold down in the future match area, too. I hear a lot of coughing. That is one... Downside to getting in a, you know, a building with a whole bunch of people all at once is that if one person gets sick, it can go right through it. All right, well, he does manage to uh, stick the Ravager here, though. <coughs> and that is going to be a problem going forward as those Wall of Omens are not going to be big enough at some point here. How do you feel about this game right now, though, Ian? We're, we're feel like Anton Antonino's ahead? Uh, I'd say, yeah, very slightly. I mean, it's a close game. Um, getting to this stage of the game with still 12 points of life and and no real offense on uh, John Stern's side of the table is a, a good spot to be in when you're playing a controlling deck. Yeah. Like Jessica. Okay. So one of the cool things about this Jessica deck is, you know, it's largely a controlling sort of value type mm -hmm. uh, three color control deck, but it ha is capable of, uh, of finishing the game really quickly with a Restoration Angel Kiki Jiki combo. Right. And then the other win con that we see a lot is uh, our, our burn spells. Mm -hmm. Burn spells thrown at the face. We saw Sean McLaren win with this deck <coughs> at the Pro Tour level. Oftentimes you'll see Celestial Colonnade, which is the land down at the bottom of Antonino's land pile there, you know, get alive get in for four, and then all of a sudden it's bolt, bolt, snapcaster, but it's just flurry of, of damage. Yeah, in the, the snapcaster bolts can really add up for sure. So despite being a control deck, it's actually, it's, yeah, it's definitely capable of closing out the game really quickly, which is a really key component in the modern format because trying to play a control deck against the, the huge diversity of decks in modern that are attacking you from so many angles is eventually you're not going to have the right answer to something, Marshall. Exactly. And in that case, you just want to go ahead and win the game. That's the best solution. Okay, well, let's uh, jump back. It looks like they're just finishing mulligans on our main table, and this one's a little bit of a standstill. You saw John Stern didn't attack there, so let's jump back up to that main match. I don't want to miss anything with this Eldrazi versus Blue Moon matchup we've got here between Tiago Saparito and Jason Chung. And here's, gosh, yeah, <laughs> when, you're, when your land's tapped for two mana, it's not bad. It's an Eldrazi Mimic on turn one. Not the most powerful play he could make, but watch what happens here, right? <laughs> this is where things start to get disgusting. Well, potentially, but it does look like Jason Chung has Z a lightning bolt. Yeah. Zap that thing. Yeah, you definitely want to take care of the Mimic before it, it gets totally out of hand. If it's copying something like a Thought Not Seer or a Reality Smasher, you're, you're in for a heap of damage. Yeah, it doesn't take much either. And Chung is going to pass the turn back with two mana up. Jason does run three mana leak, three remand. 
as well as three spell snare. And he's going to go ahead and remand here. Right. Yes, that, that was a Simeon Spirit Guide trying to cast a Thought Not Seer there on turn two. Wow, that's a great remand then. Yeah, super good remand. And he's content to just keep passing the turn back here. See, he's got in his hand a little awkward. He's got a batter skull in his hand. That's much more along the lines of his finisher. And Thought Not Seer again after a land is going to get mana leaked. So Jason Chung fighting the good fight here. Yeah, this is a wholly different game than yeah. we, saw, we saw last uh, uh, earlier in this match. Um, the Eldrazi deck having a, a bit, well, not, I wouldn't say an awkward draw, but just things not really working out quite so well um, being on the draw here for Tiago Saparito. And Jason Chung just having the perfect answers every turn. And he's just going to pass the turn back. He does have Cryptic Command mana available now. Yeah, always scary to see blue, blue, blue one out of yeah. the control deck on the other side of the table. Totally. <clears throat> Zapparito has a couple of choices here. He can play an Endless One for quite a bit, or he can play a Spell Skite, or he could do nothing. And it looks like he's just passed the turn back. And Batter Skull is the play for Jason Chung. He just says, hey, the door's open. You have nothing going except for a Mutavolt. I'm just going to run out a Batter Skull here. All right, and there is that big endless one. Tiago's going to play that for six here. The card's been doing good work. Yeah, it's just huge. You know, in the modern format where it's so low to the ground, people are used to just relying on one, two, and three casting cost creatures. A six six is just surprisingly hard to deal with. You know, yeah. Lightning Bolt does not does not deal with that very well. <laughs> yeah, totally. We've been seeing that from Thought Not Seer throughout the course of the weekend as well. Just that mm -hmm. four toughness being really good. Sixes. I mean, you're not even getting dismembered at six. We're, you know, we're talking Path to Exile, Terminate, or Bust. And this looks like the Spell Skite. Couldn't quite see it as we switched to this shot, but I do believe it was a Spell Skite. Yep. Giving further protection to that 6-6 six, six Endless One. Unfortunately for Tiago, I mean, he can attack for six here, but then Batter Skull is just going to attack back for four lifelink. So not hugely profitable. He's also potentially worried about, say, a block and a Snapcaster Lightning Bolt or something. Here's an attack from the Batter Skull. He's just going to jam it right into the endless one. Tiago Saparito, sure. Sounds fine to me. Oh, and now we see why. Anger of the Gods is going to exile that and leave him with just the Spell Skite. Batter Skull's still on the battlefield. And here's a Snapcaster Mage now. And it's going to be a Lightning Bolt to finish off the last creature on board. That's Spell Sky. Very nice. Nice sequence there for Jason Chung. He now has the option to equip the Batter Skull next turn. He can also return it to his hand and recast it if he can find another land. So things looking good. For Jason Chung, and like you said, much better. Wow, but well, there's a 7-7 seven, seven Endless one. <laughs> endless indeed. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's just out of range of uh, Batter Skull equipped a uh, Snapcaster. is only six power. What if he equips two of them? Because he does have another in his hand. Oh, does he? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It'll take a while. Yeah. It's an installment plan, but two Batter Skulls. Yeah, and, and while this Eldrazi deck does have huge monsters, it doesn't have a lot in the way of finesse, um, mm. just in terms of, you know, Jason Chung looks like he's kind of stabilized the game here. He's got a lot of um, staying power in terms of the, the batter skulls here and yeah. drawing into further Snapcaster mages and things like that. So we could just see Jason Chung just slowly kind of, yeah, 
equip those batter skulls up and just getting in there for value and grinding out the Eldrazi deck in a longer game. All right, there's an Eldrazi Mimic. <coughs> and a Ratchet Bomb. Ratchet Bomb's kind of annoying. It, it, it can take out the germ tokens. Yeah, that's the main thing it does here, but... Again, it's not a lot, though, right? Yeah, it's not a lot. And as you mentioned, Marshall, I mean, um, Jason can always just, over time, equip those batter skulls over to the Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, the real key here is that Jason's at 26 life, and Tiago just doesn't have a way to, to string along that much damage. I mean, he could probably engineer a scenario where he gets in for maybe 14, you know, gets in for a couple of hits or forces yeah. a chump, but not, not 26. And here comes a Blink Moth Nexus. All right. Interesting. It does look like he's actually going to go ahead and send in no blocks. with yeah, the Endless One. That attack seems good. Yep. No blocks. I take eight. I'm on 18. So 18 pays 16. This is going to incentivize Jason Chung to just equip to the uh, Snapcaster Mage here. Yeah, I mean, he might want to equip to the Germ first just to force the Ratchet Bomb to get activated for mm -hmm. zero. Just get it off the table, ensure that it's not going to tick up and, and later threaten Snapcaster Mages or force him to keep mana open for his Batter Skulls. Sure. But, yeah, given that the Endless One attacked, I guess he can, he can now sort of diversify his threats yeah. here. He can force the issue this way, too, by getting in and encouraging Tiago to crack the bomb, but he's not going to, and that's a huge hit. 10? Yeah, that did not work out well for Tiago there, as Jason Chung is now above the life total he was at last turn. Yeah, I admire that. Yeah, now we see Saparito put the brakes on the endless one here. Ooh, really, really backbreaking electrolyze there. Just fantastic. Wow. Kills two creatures, both of the Eldrazi mimics. They weren't doing a ton as it stood, but they were going to block at some point. And interesting, the, the Ratchet Bomb did not tick up did at not all tick there. Up. It's just staying on zero, threatening germ tokens. Uh, definitely makes the most sense on this board. But yeah, it's kind of awkward for, for Saparito in terms of how to use that Ratchet Bomb. He's... He can threaten to get rid of a germ, but he can only do that once. The Batter Skulls can still bounce back or just re-equip to the Snapcaster Mage. So it's not really a long-term solution to anything here. He doesn't look happy about it either. And it looks like Chung's just going to play around the uh, Ratchet Bomb entirely by just equipping up the Snapcaster with the other Batter Skull, generating a total of 10 power and 9 toughness here, and he can just jam. Tiago does have the opportunity to trade off to get rid of the Snapcaster Mage here if he wants to use a Mutavolt or a... Blink Moth, but the, the long-term implications of this are not great for Tiago. Yep, definitely true. Yeah, so Mutavolt gets activated. That's a 10-9 Snapcaster Mage being blocked by a 2-2 and a 7-7, so this will threaten a trade. And Jason Chung says fine. And this is why Batter Skull is in the main deck, by the way, of, of this Blue Moon deck, is that it gives this deck inevitability. It lets Jason do this kind of thing. And yeah, it takes a lot of mana, and it's not particularly quick, but he's going to be able to start returning these Batter Skulls, then equipping other Batter Skulls to Batter Skull germs, and getting in there. And as you can see, look at his life total. He's at 36. Yeah, I really admire just how clean and straightforward this blue-red deck is. I mean, blue-red control, you know, blue and red are, are Magic's best spell colors. They offer the best counter spells, the most efficient burn spells. But traditionally what they're lacking is, um, you know, threats that can close out the game. But with mm -hmm. an artifact like Batter Skull, you can put in any deck. It's just the perfect thing to slot in and kind of fill out this deck's weakness, let you keep it, you know, clean two colors, really good mana base, lets you play Blood Moon. So really, really nice uh, setup here. And Tiago's just going to pass the turn back. Jason's going to return his other batter skull. Okay. I owe to 37. You owe to 2. All right, 37 to 2. <coughs> and Tiago's just kind of waiting it out here, but yeah, no. this one looks like it's in the books for Jason Chung. Go. 
Game one did not go his way. He mulliganed and kind of got ran over by a strong draw from Tiago. But here, he has been firmly in the driver's seat. Tiago's just going to rumble with both, both uh, Blink Moth Nexuses. He's also got a Snapcaster Mage in his hand, and with Tiago at two, he could just kill him. Yeah, with sort, the, uh, sort of wondering a little bit about uh, the, why he's not Snapcastering the Electrolyze. Yeah, he um, decided to return his Batter Skull on end step. Here's another <laughs> Ratchet Bomb. He may just go for it now. Tiago very diligently chipping away with the Blink Moth Nexuses. I like that. Snap Costa electrolyze you, and you're dead. <laughs> All right, so that's going to do it. Both of these players are 5-0 and oh and have one game apiece on each other here. And we're going to get a game three out of these two, and I like that because this matchup's really interesting. Yeah, it is very, very interesting. Kind of a blast from the past in a brand new deck. All right, so we're going to jump back to our back table here where we have John Stern and Antonino De Rosa still fighting it out here. Ooh, this... What do you see in here, Ian? Uh, I see a very lopsided board, Marshall. Holy this smokes! This is uh, six lands in play, including Celestial Colonnade attacking what? and a stony silence from uh, Antonino. So <laughs> What happened here? Yeah, it makes me wonder exactly how this game played out, but I imagine some combination of John Stern keeping a hand of Springleaf Drums and Mox Opals and then getting uh. stony silence right out of the game. That's, that's really the, the story that I imagine. Wow, this is not a fun story from John Stern's standpoint, but yeah, Antonino's going to be very happy about this. Wow, th this board state is nasty. Sure, yeah, I actually, admire John Stern for still being <laughs> still sitting in that seat, because I don't know if I could stare at this <laughs> for as long as he has. Yeah, well, I guess he figures I'm playing Affinity. There's plenty of time for game three, so might as well play this one out. Yeah, looking in the graveyard I, there, I do. Isn't I do he down see, a game here? Uh oh, yeah. Okay, well, even, even more reason. To play it out there, right? <laughs> he must not be hungry. You but know? yeah, <laughs> no. it looks like maybe earlier in this game, um, John maybe moved in on an Arcbound Ravager. I do see a Dark Steel Citadel and a couple other artifacts in the graveyard, um, and then it probably just got pathed, and then Stony Silence came down, uh -huh. um, which is really <laughs> exactly the way that Antonino wants the game to play out. So. Yeah, it just looks like Antonino, right as we came to the to the match here, has entered the, you know, kind of close things out stage where he was just attacking with the Celestial Colonnade, and now he's also added... You can see the, the players discussing here. He's adding a Restoration Angel, but it's going to get dismembered. He's still going to get a card off of Wall of Omens. Stern's fighting the good fight, but he just took four on that exchange as well because he had to pay four life for the uh, dismember. So this is rough for John. Stony Silence, perhaps the best card against his deck. And on top of it, it looks like he's had some pretty rough mana issues as well. Now, both John and Antonino uh, are four and one coming into this match. Stern falls down to five life. Yep. <coughs> well, he did find a way to block here. He's going to play a Ravager. All right, you know what? Let's jump back to game three from Saparito and Chung because I don't think there's any way that John Stern can come back from this. Mm -hmm. And I admire that he's, you know, fighting it out. Why not? But, yeah, Antonino's going to win that match. So uh, he's going to improve to 5-1. and one. Let's jump back up to our main match because i got to see the, finals, the final game between these two. This has been a really exciting one. Uh, 
lopsided, though, in each game. One one to each side, and, and hopefully we get something a little more down the middle here. Yeah, this this looks like it's a game that's shaping up to be a little bit more down the middle. Um, you can see Tiago not with the aggressive curve out into Eldrazi draw that we saw in game one, but instead being a little bit more reactive here. He's got a Spell Skite and a Relic of Progenitus, you know, two cards that are sort of designed to disrupt your opponent's strategy rather than be, a pro be proactive yourself. So interesting to see how this is going to play out. The Relic of Progenitus, of course, um, being a tool to combat Snapcaster Mage as its primary purpose. And a good tool at that. So we've got a few scores uh, to update you on as well on our Side table there, we've got Andre Strasky just now winning game one against Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa. They're both on Eldrazi. And uh, on our King of the Hill match, Alex Majlaton defeats Ryoichi Tamada to steal the King of the Hill table from him. So he'll be there next round. So a huge, huge turn here in our, in our feature match game. Um, that was an attempted thought not seer from Tiago Saparito off of Eye of Ugin and Eldrazi Temple, met with Mana Leak from Jason Chong. Oh, that's and big. And into <gasps> Blood Moon. And I think we're going to see a ghost quarter for a wastes here. Yeah, that's interesting. We actually <laughs> talked about this um, before the round, Marshall, about you know how devastating is Blood Moon against this Eldrazi deck and what can the Eldrazi deck do. And one of the things we talked about is, yeah, in response to the Blood Moon, you could actually ghost quarter your own land, finding a basic wastes off of the, uh, Crazy. the ghost quarter, which is, yeah, really interesting interaction. And the reason that's so important is without wastes <laughs> itself in play, there's no way to produce colorless mana. Um, often we think of Blood Moon as turning your lands into colorless because most, you know, if your deck can't use red mana from the mountains, but it is actually red mana. It's not colorless mana. It is, yeah. Man, I, I got to say, I, I, you and I were, were looking over that and you, you saw that as like, well, this is one thing that could happen. I did not think we were yeah. going to see it. I, I actually specifically said it's unlikely that yeah. it might come up, but yeah, it did come up, so that's pretty cool to see. But we do have uh, an endless one here that, that requires any color of mana, and that's going to be one of the big upsides for Saparito is that the Blood Moon doesn't shut off his entire deck. It does shut off quite a few cards uh, unless there's a waste on the battlefield. So he should be able to operate reasonably from this position, mm -hmm. maybe not as explosively as he would have without it. Yeah, and interestingly, using that uh, Simeon Spirit Guide just to get the Endless One up to 4-4, four, four, um, 4 being the key toughness against a Lightning Bolt Snapcaster deck. Or really just a Lightning Bolt deck, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, so yeah, and that allows him to curve into a second Endless One. So two 4-4s four there. But you know what else is 4-4, four, four, Marshall? What's that? A germ equipped with a Batter Skull. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So Relic of Progenitus getting cycled from play there, exiling all the graveyards. Picking up a card for Saparito. Comes in with the two Endless Ones, willing to trade one off for the Batter Skull and giving some life back to Jason Chung. I think, I think Jason's going to be pretty happy with that. Yeah, he's definitely happy. I think Saparito, you know, just basically saying, I sort of know you're going to get the long game here between the Blood Moon on the battlefield and a Batter Skull that can bounce back and come down again. So I just got to get in this, uh, this damage while I can. And he is doing that. He gets in with the Endless One here. And he plays another one. Wow, so three Endless Ones post-Blood Moon. And this is really going to force Jason Chung's hand here. He wants to return that Batter Skull, but he needs to uh, keep this big Endless One off the battlefield. Yeah. So I think Jason deciding whether he wants to Cryptic Command and just outright counter the Endless One or maybe remand it and also bring back the Batter Skull. Oh, that is um, what he's going to do. A little yeah. mana shortcut there. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cryptic Command bouncing the Batter Skull. Yeah, yeah instead yeah. of paying the three colorless, he just turned it to yeah, his hand to get it back right now. Really nifty play. I like that, too. You know, Jason knows that the way that he loses this game is if he gets tempoed out. Basically, if that Endless One gets to get in for multiple and times. And speaking of tempo, <laughs> that's the perfect smasher. draw. Reality Smasher off the top. And that Waste is the only way that he had to cast that after the Blood Moon's down. So nice play there from Saparito, cracking that uh, Ghost Quarter earlier. Yeah, this is a tough spot, Jason Chung. He can trade off here. 
So I imagine what we see is trading the germ for the endless one, and then maybe, hmm. Yeah, next turn's going to be tricky. That Reality Smasher is going to be really hard for him to deal with. He has... Uh, reality Smasher thus far has smashed a lot more than just Reality in this tournament. It has been opponents getting crunched by that card over and over again. Looks like another Batter Skull off the top. That's, that's a game plan. Yeah, that's a potentially nice draw there. I mean, he can go Batter Skull this turn take the five from the Reality Smasher, next turn equip the other Batter Skull and start swinging back for eight. He just has to hope to fade one draw step here from Tiago Saperito. Um, you know, of another Reality Smasher oh, another smash Reality Smasher really is, is what Tiago would want to see. Looks like no on that, though. And instead, an Eldrazi Mimic. Okay. That's still potentially pretty threatening. But, yeah, I imagine we'll see Jason just wanting to go ahead and get that... Uh, other batter skull equipped and gaining eight life. The the small danger there is that a ratchet bomb off the top could take care of that germ token. Now, would he be alive still at that point? He would go up to 11? He would go up to 11 and then take seven going down to four. So, so he wouldn't it, outright be dead. And Unless Tiago drew something to make the mimic big enough. Right. Well, Tiago has no cards in his hand, so next turn yeah. he would need to draw Ratchet Bomb, and then the turn after that maybe draw another Reality Smasher or something like that. Could be a winning line um, for Tiago. But. but maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. We did assume that we're going to see the Batter Skull equip this turn. That may not be the case. Good point. We'll see what Jason Chung does decide to do. I thought we were controlling them. Remote, From here, we're just, yeah. We have the, like joysticks out. <laughs> yeah. <we're> just, yeah. <laughs> Is that not the case? Okay. That'd be fun. <laughs> Twitch plays Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it looks like uh, Andre Strosky versus Paulo Vitor Damodarosa has evened up at one apiece. So there's Matter Reshaper for Saparito. So Mattery Shaper plus uh, Reality Smasher does threaten to block and trade for the Germ and give Saparito another card off the Mattery Shaper. Uh, but, but wait, there's more. There's Anger of the Gods. And that's just the perfect answer to, to uh, Mattery Shaper, as, of course, it does exile the creature. So no death trigger there. Yeah, you know, I got to say, for a deck that makes such huge okay. things, like Tiago's does, that Anger of the Gods has been good. Yeah, it's shown itself to be really valuable there. And it looks like Jason Chung has now stabilized this board very reasonably. And yeah, Tiago's just passed the turn back. Are we going to see a battle skull, Batter Skull return to hand here? Yeah, just the judge clarifying there, wanting to make sure mm -hmm. the, the right creatures did get exiled there, and it looks like they did. And Jason just making sure that both players knew exactly where they were at in the turn, and that, of course, was on Tiago's end step. Yep, so Snapcaster Mage for no value Ooh. coming down there, allowing for the Batter Skull equip, and an attack for six, cutting Tiago's life total in half and setting up for lethal okay. next turn. That's right. That Blood Moon doing work. And there's a Thought Knot Seer, but it's going to get remanded, and that's going to do it. Jason Chung wow. from New Zealand picks up the win and improves to 6-0. and oh. Yeah, really impressive showing there. Those Eldrazi were Great looking work. scary. You know, last round in our feature match, we had, I think, three Eldrazi decks. Um, with really, really nice draws there. A great draw in game one from Tiago Saparito. But Jason Chung's deck, it looks like he, he prepared well for that matchup. It felt like it, yeah. too, right? Like, he like knew he everything. He was like, bang, 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 bang. And, and it just felt like somebody who had played that matchup a lot. Yep, for sure. So nice work for Jason. Tiago's going to have to settle for a loss there and a 5-1 and one start to his Pro Tour. Jason Chung, 6-0. That is nice. So let's jump over and see this third and final game here in round six between Andre Strosky and Paula Vitor Damodarosa. They are both playing the same deck because they both tested together.
Yep, these are these are both the uh, Channel Fireball Eldrazi deck, I guess we've been calling it for yeah. for lack of a better term, or if you will, Chalice of the Void Eldrazi. Sure. It's more descriptive. Yeah, Andre joined Team Face to Face Games, who works with Channel Fireball, and they are the, they're the ones who developed this version of the Eldrazi deck. Looks to me like both players are on six cards here. And each scrying. It looks like Andre's decided to scry to the bottom. He's got a pair of Eye of Ugin in hand. He's going to play one, which gives him access to the two mana for Eldrazi Mimic. And there's an Eye of Ugin as well for Paulo, but no play. Yeah, it's so just yet. a reminder for, for folks at home, Eye of Ugin is a legendary land. So uh, having two in your draws, you know, pretty big liability, especially on mulliganing to uh, six, if that is indeed the case. Ooh, here's Thought Knots here on turn Yikes. two here from Strosky. Yikes. And he's going to get a chance to look at a pair of matter reshapers, a reality smasher, a couple of lands, and an endless one here from Paulo. So Paulo's hand actually, yeah, looking pretty solid. Um, is it going to look a little less solid after? It's going to look slightly less solid, but, you know, he's got plenty of creatures and, and enough lands to cast them, or at least start casting them. So I think he can do without any single card in his hand here and still, you know, still have some decent game coming up. Man, Thought Not Seer and Reality Smasher have been so impressive. Endless one is what he decided to take. And he also triggered his Eldrazi Mimic, turned it into a 4-4 for the turn, and bang, take four, Apollo. Wow, and added a matter reshaper. Oh, jeez. Man, Eye of Ugin so busted in this deck. Yeah. It just I added mean, four mana that turn? Yeah. <laughs> These these lands are are no joke here. There's never been a land that tapped for four mana by itself, right? For four mana? Four. Uh, I mean, there's some cheaty answers to that, like scorched ruins and stuff like that. Okay, but, that counts. Um, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, more than that, I mean, in some ways, these Eldrazi decks are reminding me of Mishra's Workshop decks in yeah. Vintage, right? Where just the lands are so powerful. I mean, you're, you're very much restricted in what cards you can cast with them, but a land that taps for two or even three mana, like Eye of Ugin does with Urborg in play, that's just ridiculously powerful. Yeah, and in, and in the case of last yeah. turn, we got to see Eye of Ugin, it doesn't technically tap for mana, but effectively generate that mana twice. It did yeah. it for four. Tim says Lake of the Dead. Mm. <laughs> I would not accept Gaia's Cradle as an answer, by the way. Because <laughs> that taps for one million mana? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> You're a pessimist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Board state half full. So it uh, looks like uh, got a bit Paulo, of a stall here. Yeah, Paulo's finally got up to his reality smasher and that smasher, and that's large enough to keep in check Strasky's two creatures. Dismember takes out Thought Not Seer, recouping the card. And yeah, it was looking like Andre Strasky had uh, a super explosive draw this turn or this game, mm -hmm. uh, and came out really, really strong. But uh, now he's running out of steam there, and I do believe, as you mentioned earlier, Marshall. Uh, that last card in his hand is a second copy of Eye of Ugin, so that's not going to really do anything for him this game. And now it's Paulo in the driver's seat. He's got a spell sky. Yep, that'll block Matter Reshaper all day. And let's Reality Smasher come in for five. God, here we go again. Just plowing out these cards. These turns are great. And it looks like this Reality Smasher is set to go the distance here. It's got a ways to go. But it's going to be tough for Andre to compete with that if he can't find something big off the top of the library. Looks like 
Blink Moth is going to get activated here. Yeah, it's one interesting decision here for Paulo is does he want to attack with his own Matter Reshaper? Um, on the one hand, it's not a huge... Uh, you know, there's not a huge risk in terms of his own life total because he does have the Spell Sky Black to block, but there's some consideration um, into not giving Andre Strasky a card off of his own Matter Reshaper. Mm. Along with a, a good block as well. Here's a Ghost Quarter on the Blink Moth, which is going to prompt Paulo to go find a Waste and put that into play. So they're both going to trigger their Matter Reshapers here, and Andre's going to drop down to 10. These players are 4-1 and one in the tournament so far. Looking to finish strong here on day one. Just another couple of rounds after this one. And yeah, Paulo's play making a lot more sense mm -hmm. given that he has a second copy of Spellskite uh, in his hand as well. I was a little bit worried that with Strasky getting the extra draw there off the Matter Reshaper, that if one of those, that card or this next one is a Reality Smasher, it could uh, put Paulo in an awkward position having to chump with one uh, mm. Spellskite so as not to die. But now I think he's got enough breathing room now that that play makes plenty of sense. And we're going to see the same play that Andre just did to Paulo, but in reverse here. Mm -hmm. Blink Moth is going to get ghost quartered, and Andre's going to go find a waste and put it in the play. Basic land. Yeah, pretty cool seeing wastes getting played here in modern. You know, in some sense, it is the the worst of the colorless lands that it has no other special abilities, but it does have, in some sense, the special ability of being basic, which is really important when it comes to Path to Exile, Ghost Quarter, Blood Moon, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I like that a lot. It looks like Paulo is going to play and immediately crack a Relic of Progenitus. Doesn't have a ton of application in this matchup. There's a few things that happen, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually... I'm a little bit curious to see that come in. I wonder if it's coming in in combination. I think they're main decking it, right? Oh, are they just main decking it? They maybe, might be and maybe there's main not enough to sideboard out? Could be. Yeah, not really sure. I was wondering maybe if it's coming in with some combination of um, no, uh, processor it, cards. No, it is four on the, four on the board. So they are bringing it in. Mm -hmm. And that looks like it's going to be game, set, match here for Paulo Vitor Domitorosa. He defeats Andre Strosky to say, with only one loss on his record, and he beats uh, you know, the player he tested with. Mm -hmm. Says, oh, this is how we do it, kiddo, and, uh, and takes him down. So that's going to do it here for round six. Uh, we've got a couple more rounds of Modern mm -hmm. to bring you today before we uh, before we call it good for a day, but it's been exciting. Um, a yeah, lot definitely. of really cool decks and a good variety. I was down in the feature match area for the last couple of rounds uh, doing some floor reporting stuff, and uh, I just sort of, you know, got to look around at a bunch of decks. I'm like, wow, there's like five or six different decks out of eight possible down here in the oh, feature Oh, yeah, definitely. Area. Looking at the metagame breakdown, I, th I think, I don't think there was any one deck that was over like maybe 12, 14 percent of the field, so... Yeah, which is pretty typical for modern. But the, the really crazy thing is this Eldrazi deck, just because it does seem to make up a decent percentage, at least. Of yeah, what it looks to be about eight percent of the field here today. Um, but for notably, a brand new deck? notably being played uh, by some of the top teams as well. So and it's yeah, it's really exciting to that, see. That does tend to bump up that percentage. <laughs> All right, let's find out what else is going on in the tournament with Richard Hagen. Thanks, Marshall. Thanks, Ian. Two more rounds of Modern coming your way today. Then it's three rounds of Draft first thing tomorrow. Then five rounds of Modern down the stretch. We cut to top eight. And then it's best three out of five on Sunday. That's if you haven't been with us all day and you needed reminding. Why haven't you been with us all day? Shameful. Uh, some 6 and O's. Alex Magleton, 6 0. Matej Zatelkai, 6 0. The Grand Prix Stockholm winner from last year, finalist of Pro Tour Berlin 2008. Runner up behind Luis Scott Vargas. Scott Vargas, by the way, up to 5 and 1. Maki de Mahara, 2006 world champion. He has a perfect record at 6 and 0. And so does Bartlemy Lewandowski of Poland, 6 and 0. But the 5 and 1s are bunching up behind them. And 
Antonina De Rosa, Sam Pardy, Ray Perez Jr., former Rookie of the Year, Hall of Famer William Jensen, Frank Lepore, Josh McLean, both five and one. Emmanuel Gershenson, the Austrian, who's two for two in Grand Prix top eights. He's at five and one, and so is the reigning player of the year, Mike Sigrist, bubbling along nicely. If you've not been to a Pro Tour before, though, what is it like when you're just waiting for the pairings to go up and the round's about to start, you're at four and one, you're waiting to find out who are you going to play? What's the next part of your Pro Tour storyline? Risking life and limb at the start of round six was Brian David Marshall. This is what pairings looks like at a Pro Tour. Welcome back to the floor of the Pro Tour. This is Brian David Marshall. We've been trying to give you an inside look at what's going on here on the floor, give you a little behind the scenes look and bring you the coverage of the Pro Tour, but we wanted to show you the crush that happens as the pairings go up for these players. We're about to start round six. You see the players pressing up against the board, all sorts of famous players, you know, trying to figure out who they're gonna play this round, what their what fate holds in store for them for the rest of this tournament that you see Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa, you see Hall of Famer John Finkel over there. We see Antonino De Rosa sort of lurking in the back, waiting patiently. A veteran move from Antonino De Rosa. He's like, I, I don't need to be the first person to see the pairings. See Brian DeMars. <laughs> so this is A through C and D through G. So uh, there's also a similar pairing board over there and over there for the higher letters. And you know, this is what goes on every round. You know, you really see this crush, and now it's going to be head down play some magic, feature matches are gonna get called. We have an empty feature match area right now waiting to fill that up. And uh, you know, that's what's going on here on the floor at Pro Tour Oath of the Gate Watch. Looks strangely like the pairings boards at my F and M really. Not quite the same though in terms of the names who you might face at four and one. All right, um, so BDM's still out there. Uh, as you can see, there are three matches left. They are Tomoyo Sabushi of Japan at two and three against Can Canada's Joel Repta, two and three. At three and two, Matt Severa uh, is up against Andy Chan of Hong Kong, both of those at three and two. But the big one still outstanding is Scott Lip of the United States at four and one. He's up against Brazil's Roberto Gonçalves dos Santos, four and one. So those are the three matches still going. I wonder if BDM's been able to find his way out to one of them. BDM, come in, where are you? Uh, and I could tell you that uh, there's been a long delay in this match. Uh, there's been a, a judge call uh, and uh, Conclave Dos Santos is not at the table. I believe he's speaking to a judge. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening, but Scott Lip is sitting patiently waiting for the end of game three. There's a judge sitting there with him uh, we might be settling in for a little bit while here. There's going to be a fairly substantial extension on this match. Uh, and uh, you know what? Uh, there's, there's, there's no other magic to report. Uh, Matt Severo lost to Andy Chan. You, you, were, you were talking about that. He had, they were just bringing up the match slip. You're just looking up, bringing up the match slip as you guys were talking. So that was Andy Chan over Matt Severa. I don't know about the other match. So that's what's happening here on the floor. We, we may be here a while, though. I may be coming back to you. <laughs> all right, thanks very much uh, to BDM. Well, it is live and you've all seen that. You've all been at tournaments where you're sitting there going, are they done? And then you hear that mightily delightful phrase, 54 minute extension. And you just go, really? It's not that bad. I'm sure we'll have magic again very, very soon. But Gonzalez Dos Santos uh, and Lip, they're still playing therefore at four and one with the judge keeping the seat well, very thoughtful. Uh, all right, Severa Downs, uh, Sabucci and Joel Repta, uh, we're not sure about right now. So what we are sure about is that we have a tremendous player sitting on the other side of the studio, ready to walk us through their modern deck. Most noted as a limited master, but has a modern Pro Tour top eight to his name. It's a great pleasure to welcome Randy Bueller with our special guest, Chris Fennell.